I was in HMS Fearless, which was a landing platform dock or LPD, which has got a platform on the back for helicopters, hence the platform big. And the dock is inside the ship and you, it has a, a stern gate which you lower and then you flood the ship down and the dock fills up with water and you float the landing craft out, pump the dock out, close the gate and off you go. It's got headquarters facilities for me as the landing force commander and the Commodore who is commanding the amphibious ships and our staff sat side by side in this one room doing the planning beforehand and then actually managing the, the amphibious landing while it was going on. That was the joy of the passage down because within minutes we were having, you know, we were dis discussing it and I was lucky to have a little side office. In fact, it became the intelligence room. And as I remember, the, the, the options were Cow Bay, Volunteer Bay, Capamenta, Salvador, yes. and San Carlos. Yes. And then I rather wanted to have a fourth option into the Barclay Sound. Yes. And I can't remember now what, what it was that you were unhappy about about Barclay Sound. Well, I, I was only unhappy in the extent, I think, that um, you and South Petoli had reported in the sailing days that he'd, he'd met a fairly heavy swell in there, which would have made shipshore movement yes. difficult, particularly with the uh, Mexi flats. We had uh, a very useful officer on board, a chap called Ewan South Petalia, who had commanded the Falkland Island Detachment some four or five years earlier and had written a book about all the beaches because he was trying to sell it as a pilot. <laughs> At the drop of a hat, I'd be summoned to Julian and Mike's cabin. It might be three o'clock in the morning, they'd be in their dressing gowns with a great chart of the Falklands on the deck. And a big toe would descend. There, you, this was later on when they were homing in on specific places. And I'd go away and come back in half an hour with a, a, a full lecture on this, that place. And one of the places they, a big toe landed on was Volunteer Bay on the east coast, north of Stanley. It's a wonderful beach for landing on with in landing craft. And at the back of Volunteer Bay is the only king penguin colony in the Falklands. I knew that if we used that beach as our main landing beach, with all the vehicles and the stores and the logistics, and the penguins would go. They really would go. So I sort of invented lots of military reasons, not the nautical reasons, why this was not a good place to to even think of landing amphibious forces. He was absolutely invaluable, because he could say, I wouldn't land there because of this, or here's a place you can land. So it meant you cut down the number of options very quickly into what was possible and what wasn't possible. We didn't have enough armour or anything like that to do a head-on Normandy-type assault. We didn't have any swimming tanks like they had in Normandy. So we had to land where there weren't much enemy. So that led us to landing away somewhere out of range of their guns. And we went for, for San Carlos because it was away from where they had any um, serious enemy. And in fact, they had in the end a company sitting there. And it also, of course, imposed a problem. And we had to get from there to the other end with no roads and no road transport. So we were going to be dependent on helicopters and landing craft and people to get us there. We both of us decided on St Carlos that that's what we would go for. When I got there, I was disappointed that it wasn't more like a Norwe Norwegian fjord with high cliffs and stuff, but it was enough to make it awkward when the ships were anchored very close inshore for pilots doing 400 knots, 350 knots or something like that, always with a sort of slight risk of land a bit too close to them. What we'd planned to do was to bring the, send an escort in to just double check there was nobody there. And we would then come in and lie off, lower the two LPDs, Interiors and Intrepid, get out the landing craft, get her up out of the water again so she's manoeuvrable, the ship, and then we would send those landing craft off to Canberra and other ships if they weren't already loaded and so on and we'd start the landing and then they would go on in and then the ships would follow in when we were certain 
there was no opposition in there and no mines. So the first people to do the mine testing were the escorts with the landing craft. The plan was to take the, uh, the landing craft down in the dock, obviously, through the kelp and then land three, uh, two para and 40 commando slightly separate in case they sort of met each other in the middle, middle of the settlement. And the reason for going through the kelp was that if the place was mined, they wouldn't have mined it in the kelp. So I thought that was the safer passage. The landing was at, was at night and at midnight, and there was some discussion between myself and Mike over this, and it's typical how you do it, is that I wanted to land <clears throat> at, at last light and have the whole night to get myself sorted out in peace and quiet because the Argentines didn't have an all-weather capability of air. He quite naturally wanted to land at first light, so he had all darkness to do the long passage in. So he split it down the middle, midnight. A typical sort of British compromise. We'd also put some SBS and in as a hit team to take out some people on Fanning Head who overlooked the entrance to San Carlos, and they had an, uh, a 105 millimeter anti-tank gun, which would have caused a lot of damage had it been left there. We flew a, a mission just after dark from well out to sea in a helicopter with this thermal imaging thing, which was a huge thing about the size of a wheelbarrow poking its nose out of the side of a helicopter. And it picked up the enemy positions uh, by thermal imaging. I think it was the first time it had ever been used in, 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 in war, this bit of kit. They then came back, briefed the SPS, who were then landed by helicopter and then uh, attacked the enemy position and kept them busy and occupied while we were uh, carrying out the landing. It was meant to be a dark landing, i.e. before dawn. Well, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Most don't even survive that long. It wasn't helped by a soldier from, an unfortunate soldier, I think, from the parachute regiment, fell trying to embark into a landing craft and between the craft and the ship and was had his pelvis crushed, time was lost fishing him out. So what should have been a, a dark landing became a daylight landing. It was light, beautiful sunny day, and above us, jet aircraft flying around, zooming bombs down into the bay, uh, shooting up some of the ships, shooting up some of the, uh, the landing craft, and there's this poor little landing craft with myself and the other team in there, crushed into it. I think there were maybe about 40 or 50 in there. On, it should have only had uh, 30 guys on board, but it didn't, and it didn't have sufficient live jackets. So with the, the weight and the amount of equipment they had, it had evicted it, I'm afraid we got straight down. Two barrel were going into the south because it was closer to Sussex Mountains where their the eventual um, objective was. So I took them in and we fanned out either side so that all four landing craft you know, landed together and we lowered the ramp and nobody moved. And the, the Marines shouted, down ramp, out troops! And the Paris hadn't the slightest idea of what we were talking about. <laughs> Anyway, somebody in the, in the forward end of the landing craft shouted, Paras, go! And I think is what they shout in an aeroplane when you jump out. Well, they all rushed ashore, happy as sandboys. Once we got ashore, we realised we didn't have air superiority. These ships were very vulnerable, so we had to run all the stocks ashore into Ajax Bay. But, of course, the order from the task, the naval task, force commander and from Northwood when we started to lose ships and after the first day's bombing in Ajax Bay, we realised that these ships were far too vulnerable and they had to get out. So we had to offload as quickly as we possibly could. But we didn't, we were not able in night time to offload everything. We just couldn't do it. So, for example, one of our dressing stations, most critically, Canberra, the great white whale had got a lot of my stocks on board, including one dressing station. And because that was politically going to be an absolute disaster if it was hit, and it's a miracle it wasn't, it just shot off, carrying my dressing station with it. A couple of machine guns or an alert pilot, and we could have been in trouble. However, we got away with it. We landed 
where I intended to land, we cleared up the coast and took the meat processing plant unopposed, of course, and then left there and went straight up the hill and started digging in. With a huge sigh of relief, the problem now was the Navy was going to be the subject, the target for all these very brave Argentine pilots, and that indeed is what happened. And we watched, we watched, it was like a, it was like an amphitheater. We were, we were the spectators. I was surprised how, how, how few casualties there were, you know, and this sort of thing. And okay, and I understood that the ships were easy targets, so, you know, dead. E even if they weren't sunk, they would inevitably be damaged either by machine gun fire or something. But luckily, there was no artillery there for the Argentines to take us on. Um, and that again is thanks to the special forces being there several days ahead. We got ashore with a huge sigh of relief, our natural habitat. <clears throat> um, yes, we were going into the unknown. Yes, we had to cope with the weather and the enemy, but this was what we trained for. This was what we're ready for. Now, let's get on with it. <laughs>